Well, hello, this is Seth Turner for JPI TV with An American Legend. I'm with Joe Sinnott, one of the great artists and uh, one of the individuals who's had a significant impact on many uh, uh, lives throughout the past uh, 50 or 60 years with his artwork in comic books, certainly representing Marvel um, and uh, uh, so many others. So, Joe, it's nice to be here with oh, you today. Oh, Seth, it's my pleasure. Um, and Joe, let's let's begin at the end. Here we are today in uh, very late 2014, and you still are very active in um, inking for the Spider-Man Sunday comics. That's right. I'm. Uh, I was 88 years old in October, and I've been working with Stan Lee. Of course, Stan created the uh, Spider-Man, the Incredible Hulk, and the Mighty Thor. He created most of the Marvel characters back in 1962, and I've been working with Stan for 64 years. And uh, of course, he's out in California, and he's got his problems now, like all of us have. He's uh, got macular de degeneration, and he, he can't hear anymore, but he's still involved in the in, in the Spider-Man uh, Sunday strip for uh, King Features and also the, the Daily. And uh, it's in about, oh, gee, eight or nine hundred papers around the country. So uh, he, he it's what keeps him going. He goes to comic shows all around the world. He called me, oh, about a month ago and said he could just got back from uh, uh, Australia. Two days later, he came, he went to London for a show and then he came back and he went to a small show in Monterey uh, near his hometown in L.A. And he, uh, he said to me, Joe, he said, i got to stop taking these flights. He said, I'm really beat. He said, can you imagine, 93 years old, and he's wondering why he's tired, you know, <laughs> flying to Australia of all places, you know. And what's that, a 25-hour trip? Yeah, it's, it's a long time. Really. But he's one of a kind. If there was a, uh, a ballroom filled with 200 people, 200 comic fans, which there are many times, and he stands out. Everybody wants to, you know, uh, so to speak, uh, talk to Stan because he's got so much charisma. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. And he's a very likable guy and certainly talented as a writer and creator. And yet he's been very complimentary of your work, uh, certainly. And uh, what would Stan Lee say about Joe Sinnott? Well, of course, he, he would really put it on quite thick. There's a picture of him down there, Joe, right behind you. That was in uh, 1994 out in San Diego. And uh, But Stan, I mean, he he's always on. He's always smiling. Like I said, he's the most humorous guy I, I think I know. He's spontaneous. Everything is. But he he talks that many of the the pencilers would fight to get Joe Sinnott to be yeah, the well, anchor. That, that's <laughs> what he said. And of course, I no matter who I worked with, and uh, I always did my best. And there isn't anybody. I mean, I hate to say this. There isn't anybody I've ever worked with that I feel I didn't enhance their work a little bit. You know, I. Maybe I put too much of my own spin on things, but uh, but you know I always felt I made their work look better, and I've worked with some good people. Well, if I were to say Jack Kirby, I mean certainly he's yeah. uh, uh, one oh, of the better. Well, known. Jack is considered the king of the comics, and he's certainly not the best draftsman, because uh, the best draftsman in comics was John Buscema, and I worked with him uh, on the Fantastic Four and also. Uh, hundreds of books uh, on the mighty Thor, and uh, John, he, he, nobody could touch him as a, uh, a draftsman. But Kirby, Kirby could tell a story better than anybody. He, he had such a great imagination, but th his drawing at times lacked a little bit. And I, I was the good. Uh, uh, alter I was the good partner for him. But what I find amazing is you you actually were working with him on projects and for many years you hadn't even met him until the 70s. Exactly. I worked on him from 1962 actually till 1972, 10 years before 
Never talked to him on the phone, and uh, it, of course, he, I, even while he w he wasn't even working for Marvel by the time that he had left. Right, he had left. Uh, he worked over DC, then he came back to Marvel, and uh, I always worked for Marvel. DC used to call me, and ask me to come over, and they say they'd pay me more than Marvel would pay. And then Stan, I tell Stan that DC wanted me to come over, and he said, Joe, uh, although DC did pay. Uh, a little more than Marvel, generally. But he said, whatever they pay, we'll pay the same. And I knew all the characters at Marvel, and uh, I, I liked the characters better than DC's characters. So I never, I, I ghosted a few things for DC. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Well, yeah. Could you give us some examples? Because these are lost uh, to yeah. the uh, comic I, historians. I know it. I, uh, like I said, I, I did a few uh, pin-up pages with Kurt Swan, who was a great Superman artist, and I, in fact, it was Superman that I drew. And uh, there were a couple other, mainly uh, covers. I would work with some of DC's uh, uh, top-notch pencilers, and uh, they would ask me if I would work with a couple of their pencils, which I did. And uh, I told them I didn't want any credit, you know, on the covers or whatever. And uh, so I, I did so many things. Like if my son Mark was here, he knows everything I ever did. And the uh, fact that I hate to tell the story, but he, uh, I have a, an index up there. He, Mark put it together all 10 years ago of everything I ever did. Everything. If, if, I, if I was paid $10 by someone in Saugerties to do a little sketch, I would write it down. I kept a record of everything I ever did. And uh, so uh, one time uh, we went almost went belly up, and um, I hate to digress here, but in, in '58, last the comic industry was in bad shape. Uh, yeah. Because they they came out with the comics code, it killed. The, the, we had a a horror trend which was very popular, and. Uh, some of the smaller companies, uh, they got a little gross. That was Frederick Worthman who came out with uh, the, uh, yes. the findings? But, yeah, exactly. And uh, But in any case... Uh, but, we, Joe, we, do you think, though, some of the horror comics might have been going a little too far Oh, of course. Time? Like I said, some of the smaller companies that had to compete with us in D.C. Uh, had to go overboard a little bit with their with their stories and their work. and uh, But... Uh, I, Marvel may have occasionally, of course, it was called Timely back in those days. But uh, when we went belly up, I had a good friend. He worked for, naturally for Marvel. And he called me up, and I was out of work. All the guys were out of work. And he said, and I had, uh, we couldn't collect unemployment because we didn't, we were freelance artists. We didn't pay Social Security. So, um, and I was very naive in those days. Uh, when, when Stan called me up and said, Joe, we're going to suspend operations for at least six months, I, I said, hey, Stan, that's terrible. But I thought I could go in and sign up for unemployment. So I went in to the local office, <laughs> signed up for unemployment, and I knew the girl that was in charge there. And I got up to her. It was a big, long line. And I said, Joe sent it. She said, yeah, I know, Joe. But she said, you know, you can't collect. You never paid Social Security. Mm -hmm. You know, which I did when when I did my work for Marvel, I'd voucher it, you know, so much a page, so much a whole story, and they'd pay me a whole check. Nothing was taken out of it, you know. So uh, I, I learned fast, you know. So anyway, let's make a long story short. <clears throat> a friend of mine at Marvel, uh, like I say, it was timely back in those days, he said, Joe, I got in a small account up at Charleston, they were a cheap outfit that did romance books, you know. And romance really wasn't selling at that time. But he said, I can get all the work I want. The, the rate is terrible. He said, but at least it's work. And I had three children at the time. So I said, I'll, I'll take it. So I started penciling for him, and he would ink it. So six months later, when Stan called me back up and said, Joe, we're starting up again, uh, I said, Stan, I said, I got a couple other accounts. I had picked up an account at D.C. I did the Life of the Beatles for D.C. And uh, uh, while well, I had the Charlton thing where I was doing the romance penciling. And uh, so anyway, uh, 
I, uh, I, I would work on the mar. I told Stan I'd do two books a month for him. I would ink two books a month. So I would ink during the day. I'd have my supper. I'd go upstairs and work for about an hour and a half doing the romance. They were easy to do, big close-ups and whatever. So anyway, make a long story short here again, uh, Mark said to me when he was put together the index, he said, Dad, you know how many, how many covers, how many uh, pages do you think you penciled for Vince Coletta? He was doing the inking on it, and it was his account, actually, and I was doing the pencils. So, gee, I said, holy most I worked with him for about three or four years uh, while I was doing the Marvel stuff, and I said, uh, must be 500 pages at least. I said, it seems like that anyway. He, should, he said, you did, you penciled 2,700 pages. Wow. And they were all done after supper, you know, at night. And uh, like I said, when, we, you were we, free, we, when you were freelancing, Seth, in those days, you didn't turn anything down. People would call me to do billboards, record covers, and I would squeeze them in somehow. I did, local little local uh, advertising agencies would call me up and want me to do brochures on vacation spots and everything, and I I would squeeze them in somehow. I did the um, I did the crossword covers for seventeen years, uh, and I, I like I said I squeezed all these things and you, you besides know, playing softball at night, Joe, right? <laughs> Holy Moses. I I I uh, I coached softball for 17 years. Can you imagine? Uh, <laughs> they were all night games, of course. But that's another story. So you were burning the candle at both ends. You're not kidding. <laughs> but hey, you were young then, and like I said, you, you had the stamina, and you could do it. You know, Joe, you've hit on so many points, and I don't even know where to begin <laughs> because I, I guess what I realized from doing research on on your career and on uh, what you've accomplished and what you've done. <laughs> is that I've been surrounded by your artwork for a, a better part of my life, whether uh, it's those crossword puzzle books that are on every, you know, doctor's know. office coffee table exactly. that you've ever walked oh, into. Or, they were fun uh, doing, you know. Uh, um, I or would your do, Enchanted Deer book. I and, would do, well, that was for uh, Dell Comics, and uh, that was, a, uh, that was a, an, un, an unusual story. When I brought my samples down to show them, I was going around to different companies, and I was getting work at all of them. Now, in other words, I was really, I, I was loaded down with work. Like I said, Good I problem went, to have when I went to era. Dell, yes. Dell wanted me to do 65 pages of the life of the Beatles. And this is when they were just coming into their being. Yeah. And so I did 65 pages, pencils and inks, and they, they liked the way I did likenesses. Now, by the way, did you ever hear back from the Beatles themselves? About, no. Or, you know, all ever... No, because they're, they're a, a tight organization. What about Bing Crosby? Oh, uh, well, that's another. I, I used to hear from Bing. I got three or four, more than that, probably even four or five letters. But th those were freebies. I would do covers because that, that was part of my uh, hobby, the Bing. And I did, rec I did uh, magazine covers. I'll show you some later. I did record covers. I did about 15 record covers of Bing. And... Uh, <clears throat> So he, he would write to me and, uh, you know, comment on them, so to speak. But uh, like I said, I, I was doing billboards. I had an account with the, now it's Price Chopper. It used to be uh, Albany Public Markets. I used to do all their ads with, wow, with a I'm character kidding. I invented. Uh, he, he had a hatchet, and he was chopping down prices. But after about two years, they were sued by some company that thought, that maybe uh, the character that I drew was too much like one of their characters. But anyway, so they, they went down to just the hammer. But I don't, I mean the hatchet. Right. But I don't do the hatchet. But there were just some of the things. I did so many local uh, advertising agencies, uh, uh, you know, brochures and, and summer flyers and things like advertising to local uh, resorts and everything that, it's amazing. I look back. Well, how did I do all that work, you know? And see, so you're bringing up so many topics, though, Joe. I, again, it's, it's, <laughs> let, let's go to the Comics Code Authority, because yeah. then I'm going to bring that, that back to something. Um, 
One day I was in a, an event where uh, uh, Michael Uslin, who owns the Batman uh, franchise at this point, okay. he talked about being a young man when the Comics Code Authority started to put the kibosh on mm -hmm. comic books. I was about 56, roughly. And he talked about even townships were having mass burnings of comic books and it was being looked at as, as being all evil. And here he was as a well, child who embraced comics. And uh, I know that comic books were one of the contributing factors to my literacy and learning how to become a good reader. That's and, how I learned to read. And I shared with you one time it was Phantom Comics that I, as a young man I was really I, I just uh, oh, uh, took in the Phantom sure. and I know you were a fan sure. as well. Uh, yeah. And then I'll go and I'll say that the probably the character I appreciate the most now is Daredevil. Really? And for an abstract reason, um, I became a teacher of special education. Right. And can you imagine a superhero who is blind, right. who has a disability, and yet goes on to... That's Stan Lee. Uh, it shows you how smart he was, uh, you so, know, to make, make a blind superhero. He did the same thing with the Fantastic Four. Of course, they were his, they were his first creation in, as a superhero. We were floundering, uh, you know, the early 60s. We were doing monster books at that time. And they were, they were selling, but n nothing spectacular. And uh, so anyway, uh, Martin Goodman, the publisher, said to Stan, Stan, why don't you reissue some of the old superheroes we did in the early 40s, like Captain America and the Human Torch. And uh, so Stan did. And it takes about three months to see the sales receipts. Uh, so anyway, Stan saw the, re, uh, the reports on Captain America, and th they sold quite good, the reissues. So Martin Gooden says, Stan, why don't you come up with some new characters? They might sell. So he thought up the F Fantastic Four. Now, this is late 61 in m November. So he, he uh, I mean, Stan was a brilliant guy to think about it. There were four astronauts. You probably know the story. They were up famous, in, that cover is, is They were up in famous. space, and they got bombarded with cosmic rays, and it gave the four astronauts different powers. You know, human, I mean... By the way, as a comic book reader, thank God for cosmic rays, gamma <laughs> rays, <laughs> atomic explosions, <laughs> uh, radioactive insects. Cool. Thank God we have those. Yeah, guys, you get killed, and you can bring them back. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Stan, he made all these characters with special powers, but the thing, he uh, he made him where the others could turn themselves on anytime they wanted. The Invisible Girl, Reed, or Johnny, uh, the Human Torch. But but the, uh, the the thing couldn't. He'd be walking down the street as Ben Grimm, the All American football player, and all of a sudden he'd turn into the thing. You know, Orange Rock, and this was embarrassing. He's in his trench coat, you know, and. Uh, so anyway, and, and he had uh, uh, human frailty, so to speak, you know. He, got, he would get aggravated, he'd get uh, depressed. The other superheroes never did. But anyway, so, th but that was Stan. But then again, he, here again, when the Daredevil came along, he made him blind. So Stan was such a great writer. The stuff was pretty simple back in those days. But what happened was, the college kids took on, that's where we really started selling our books, the colleges. And Stan used to go around to all the colleges talking about superheroes and whatever. And that really opened up the, whole, the early 60s, the whole business. Of but did you, did you feel anything personal when you had the Comics Code Authority kind of beating up that, that, uh, that th I, this well, work hey, was? I remember, I says, what is, what, I think his name is Worthman. And I said, hey, in fact, the first, he, he had a show on television in front of Congress, and Senator Kefauver was in charge. He was the chairman, I guess it was. And he, he naturally interviewed uh, Dr. Worthman. And the drawing he held up to show the people, you know, you know, this is what they're showing in comics, was a drawing I did for, it was, it was called Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. And she applied for a job as a uh, babysitter. And the splash showed Sarah applying to this, you know, woman, very wealthy woman. But Sarah really looked bad. I mean, I, I did 
make her look evil, you know, and she's going to teach little kids. Well, you know, Worthman thought that that was too gross, you know, but it was my drawing they held up at that committee, you know. So you've been before Senate. <laughs> yes, but I, you know, I, I couldn't see nothing wrong with it, you know, but like I said, some of the smaller companies, they would show a, a meat counter with body parts cut up and stuff like that was going too far, you know. But some of the stories were good. EC Comics, they were they were the best comic. They only had a few books, but they had great writers and great artists, and it put them out of business. And they their stories were great. They really were, and uh, that was one of the. Uh, and I think you could casualties. explain explain too that there was also a transition which was natural through this after post World War II. First, uh, there was Americana oh. was uh, uh, still uh, embraced, and then you moved into doing the westerns. To your favorite of drawing cowboy hats. <laughs> so well, like touch said, on any of these. I parts. joined Marvel Comics while I went to school in 1949 down in the city. Now it's called the School of Visual Arts. It's the biggest art school in the world. They got five. Japan, Germany, whatever, but it was called the Cartoonist and Illustrator School when I went. And Bern Hogarth, he was the director, and he uh, he was the artist on uh, Tarzan. He was an excellent cartoonist, drew very well, realistically, very very great cartoonist. But anyway, uh, so my one of my teachers was Tom Gill, and. Uh, he liked the way I drew. I was a little bit ahead of some of the other kids, you know. And uh, so he asked me, he said, Joe, he said, I need an assistant. He said, I have a lot of accounts, because he, he was a working cartoonist on the side. After he went home, he worked in his little sun porch, and uh, he said, would you like to be my assistant? And he told me how much he'd pay me, and I was on a GI Bill, just barely making it down the city. And uh, <clears throat> so I said, oh, sure. So I started working for Tom while I was still going to school. So I'd go out to his uh, place on Saturdays and take the Long Island Railroad and go out to uh, Rockville Center and uh, work all day long on Westerns, love stories, uh, science fiction, all different venues of different uh, uh, comics. And uh, I learned more from Tom actually than I did from the school. And uh, so anyway, um, I worked with Tom about nine months, and uh, th then it got so I was doing everything. In other words, he was signing it, but I, I did, at first he, he wanted to do the heads to make it look like his work, but then he let me do everything. So I, I just got married that, that, that time, and I said to Betty, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go over to Stan and see if he'll, he'll give me some work because, uh, you know, the... Uh, I'm doing everything for Tom now. That's so a, I that, went, that was a level of confidence at yeah, this oh, point. Oh, yeah, I did have a lot of confidence. So I went over to the stand, and he, he stands, I, I figured somebody was doing Tom's work, and he so he gave me a script right away, The Man Who Wouldn't Die. I'll never forget it, it was a three-page Western. And I went home, and I, I should have had it done in three days, but it took me a week because I was really being careful with it. You know? So I brought it in, in the stand, and uh, of course he liked it, and uh, he gave me another script. He, he would sit at his desk with his typewriter. He wrote all the stories in those days, whether it was a Western, a science fiction, a whatever. And he had a stack of scripts. We worked from a script in those days on his left. And he, he typed on uh, yellow legal paper, and he was so easy to work with. He made it simple for the artist. Of course, if later on they went, he invented the the Marvel style. They call it. He would call up the artist and say, "I I I got a story here, like you know the Fantastic Four, and I want the four of them uh, on a space uh, ship uh, that's been you know abandoned out in space, and uh, they're running the pro so." You know, make up the drawings, and then I'll write the script to it. So the artist would make up the drawings. He's really telling the story. And then he turned in the artwork with no balloons, and Stan would look at each panel and then fill in the balloons. I mean, I could do that, you know. So anyway, I didn't like that, that way of working, but it was the Marvel way. And 
because you felt you were doing some of the writer's work, you know? So in any, in any case, um, it was a transition, so to, so to speak, uh, in styles and, and ways of working. They still do it that way today. And I, I don't approve. I like working from the script. You know? But anyway, Stan would take a script off the top of the, pa of the pack. And uh, it, it didn't have to be a Western. It could be a, a de detective story. It could be, a, like I said, a romance or a biblical story. He just gave it to you, and you were expected to do, it, to do it because you were a professional, you know. And it was a great time to work because there were short stories, five and six pages long, because once they went to the superheroes, they became 18 to 20 pages. So you never got bored because you went from a Western to a science fiction or whatever. So I loved working in the 50s. But of course, this, once the serial superheroes came out, uh, that was our bread and butter, and that's what exploded the industry, you know, and uh, really made comics what they are today. Do you have a favorite superhero? Well, yeah. I have two, actually. Uh, of course, the Fantastic Four, uh, you know, being they were the first ones I worked on, and also Thor came right in after uh, the mighty Thor, and I, I, I penciled uh, my own Thor for about five or six issues, and but the trouble was, I had a great account at Treasure Chest that I had picked up at the same time, and they did the type of work that I really loved doing. I, I was doing the life of John Kennedy, MacArthur, and Eisenhower, Babe Ruth, all the people because they liked the way I did likenesses. You know, I I had a an aptitude for that. Did you ever get to do General Custer? Yes, I did. I didn't do the uh, Custer's Last Stand though. But I've done many Custers, you know. But, uh, of course, I... And you've got an affinity for Civil War era? Oh, I do. As well. That whole top shelf is all Custer up there, you know. And uh, basically, you know, most stories are alike. And uh, What about General Custer, though, is something that, that, that you're drawn oh, to? Oh, I... Because uh, 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 there's a couple of books up there that are, uh, are uh, pro-Custer, you know, naturally. The early ones, especially. Of course, I, he, as you would know, he was held in high regard by the public in, this, in the eight, in 1800s, you know. Oh, he was a big hero. It's only in the modern day where, as you know, they, all the heroes are maligned, so to speak. Babe Ruth was maligned. Well, through the Civil War, he was certainly oh, embraced. Oh, he was, he was and... the number one hero in the Civil War. I got a book over there. I was showing someone yesterday the greatest paintings Rock, Norman Rockwell couldn't do it. Joe, you see that? You see where it says Lane Decker? That's it. Sorry. That's it. I think these paintings are the greatest thing by an illustrator that I've ever seen. Art Kunstler, he's got, a, he's got an exhibit going over. Someone knew it. Guy's got a nice wow. print, printing, huh? Yeah. So he's... He had a couple copies and he thought I'd like, that's what I say, people send me books all the time. But this guy, he did the whole Civil War in paintings and he's unbelievable. But uh, I, I got nice, nice picture of Custer fighting uh, Jeb Stewart. Oh, the, the, these, these paintings are un, really unbelievable. <clears throat> Well, I don't want to uh, distract in talking about the Civil yeah, right. War, um, but I, I do know that that's something that 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 your is one of your interests. Um, but yeah. you know, oh, it looks like a photograph. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Isn't that unbelievable? That's so realistic. Oh, you wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't know that that was work counselor. He uh, has he has a mo three month exhibit over at Norman Rockwell's museum. I'm, I'm trying to get over there before it's over with. Well, who are who are the artists that you uh, uh, think the most highly of? Well, of course, I, I was brought up on Terry and the Pirates and Flash Gordon, and maybe Prince Valiant a little bit. So I grew up, as most kids in the 30s did, they, they were the two most popular strips. Terry and the Pirates, because he was a kid, my little couple of years older than me, in 1934 it came out, and... Uh, I was eight years old, Terry was 10. And of course, he, he fought the Chinese bandits and 
it was every day was a cliffhanger. That's where the expression came from, and uh, and and of course, uh, uh, you know, um, Milton Kniff was a little crude at that time, but he had a friend that was doing a, a rival strip called uh, Scorchy Smith. It, in, it was in minor papers, but he was a better artist than Milton Kniff. And Kniff, working with him, he was his best friend. Uh, Noel Sickles' style rubbed off on, on Kniff, and it made the Kniff the uh, icon that he was, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, Flash Gordon, 34, he came out also. And, you know, growing up in the 30s, Everything was new in the 30s for kids, eight, and eight years old, 10 years old. Yes, Saturday afternoon cereals with uh, Flash Gordon and the Lone Ranger. Everything was new. It was a, an exciting period. Nobody had any money, but we didn't, didn't know we didn't have any money. <laughs> but I'm telling you, as far as comics and movies went, uh, it was a great period. And uh, so anyway, as far as comics went, it was Milton Kniff and uh, Alex Raymond. And uh, of course, when I got older, you know, uh, even though I, I, I still drew like, uh, uh, you know, Milton Kniff, and I had a combination of, of both of their styles. And, uh, but then, you know, you learn some of the illustrators, of course, uh, Milton, I mean, uh, Norman Rockwell did so many post covers that uh, he did 330, I think. And it's amazing, uh, Joe Leyendecker over there, his work is unbelievable. He, uh, he did 331. He did one more cover than Norman Rockwell. And in 1942, he was fired by the Saturday Evening Post. They felt he was passe, you know. And, uh, of course, Rockwell was getting all the uh, plum uh, assignments, you know. And yet they were the best of friends, the two of them. They shared in the a studio together, and uh, but uh, like I said, the uh, Lion Decker. Joe, would you just pull the Lion Decker out? He was unbelievable. He he for years he had the arrow shirt collar. Back in the 30s, you know, Joe in the 20s, shirts didn't come with a collar. You bought the collar. It, it was plastic, like that's a collar. That's a plastic. And it had a button on it, and you buttoned it. They were all made in Troy. That's Tro right. The Troy's Collar City. The Collar City. That, and, my uh, birthplace, Troy, New York. No the collar, kidding. Absolutely. Home, ah! home of Uncle Sam and, That's and me. That's it. <laughs> but uh, I mean, look at this. Look at the style. And you went had. to Gloversville for your gloves, and yes, you got your, your exactly. collars from Troy. Oh yeah. But 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 Rockwell was influenced by Leyendecker, You know, Leyendecker was very. Very cartoony in a way, you know, but he had a great style. And of course, he had all the arrow shirt collar ads for years, and uh, he was ver very stylized. Uh, like, look at this. That's another shirt uh, arrow. Now, but, now uh, are there any uh, uh, famous advertisements that you were part of that that maybe? Um, well, I did, I did an awful lot around. for the Albany Public Market. And, uh, of course, I did a lot of record covers, uh, not only uh, of Bing Crosby. I did the uh, shadow radio shows and... Uh, the shadow knows. Uh, oh, the shadow. Uh, that's one of my favorite... Um, in fact, if, if I, well, I he knew knows you were the coming. evil that lurks in the hearts uh, of I all men. I thought you were going to ask me those questions. <laughs> I'd, I'd drag out some of that stuff, you know? Probably over here someplace. Well, well I, I... You know... Like, Joe, would you grab that, uh, well, that big black? Uh, you know, and I know that this gets a little abstract, but I, I talked about how, you know. Uh, uh, that's, that's it. Just pull that out. Now, this was a record cover I did of Bing, Entertaining the Troops, 1944. Let's, let's turn and let the cameras get a look at this. That's one of my favorites. It's done in a craft tint, they call it, paper. It's a special paper. They don't make it anymore. It's very, it was that's very expensive. Saying. They used to use it for newspaper work. You do your black and white drawing, first you pencil it, then you ink it black and white, and then you have two bottles, a white fluid and a black fluid. And if you want a double tone, like here the scarf, you dip it in the black bottle and go right over the drawing, and you get a double tone, comes right out. 
And if you want a single tone like his face here, you dip it in the white bottle and you get the light tone. But if you notice, I got dark and light. But when you, when I look close, there are individual, tiny little individual horizontal lines it, it, in there. It pops out of the paper once you put this fluid on it, you know. But the drawing is already there, the whole drawing. But this gives you tone, like the helmet and, you know, the scarves and everything. In fact, that's my brother Jack. I, I drew him in the picture. Oh. He was a sergeant. That's him up there, of course. And, and Jack uh, passed away in the army, correct? He was in, killed in France. France. Yeah, he fought all through Italy and uh, fought Anzio never. With the 3rd Army? 3rd Division. Third and the 4th, 5th Army. And he, uh, he when he joined, he, he, he fought first in Casino up in the mountains when he first joined the 3rd Division. And he, um, <clears throat> he then he fought in Anzio for four months, never hurt. And he wrote a letter home saying that of his original company, which was probably 220 men, there was only six that hadn't been either killed or wounded, and he, he was never touched. And then, of course, they invaded southern France, and uh, he was killed two weeks later at a little town called Mont Lamar. It was the nougat capital of the world. They made nougat candy there. And Jack, when he was heading up the valley chasing the Germans, he said, uh, you can smell the nougat candy. We, we, we know we're headed for Mont, Mont Lamar. And, of course, Mont Lamar is where he was killed, you know. And, uh, of course, um, you, 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 you've seen the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan. Sure. You remember when the mother was washing dishes and she looked out the window and saw the army car coming way up the road on the farm? That's just the same scene that my mother experienced because uh, she, uh, we lived on a farm up in West Camp and uh, of course Oscar Schlinker got the telegram in Saugerty. The people in Saugerty knew that Jack had been killed before we did uh, because of the office, uh, you know, the Western Union office. It got around. I had just started my first period in class uh, in high school and uh, I was in shop class. That was my first period. And my, my cousin Mary came in the door of the shop class, and she was crying, and she motioned to me, you know. And I walked out to her, and she said, a friend of ours was waiting out in his car, Mr. Moore. And uh, I, I, the first thing I thought of my father, of course, he worked up in the cement plant. He was a foreman up there, but a lot of men, workers were killed up there, you know. So I thought something happened to Dad. So I got out to the car, and Mr. Moore said uh, they got some bad word on Jack. So anyway, make a long story short, the, uh, the, the postmaster in West Camp got the telegram, and he didn't have the heart to bring it up to my mother. He knew my father worked up the Alpha, so he drove up to the Alpha and gave my father the telegram. And of course, I have the telegram now, and you can see where Dad just ripped it up part to get at it and of course he brought it up to mother and it must have been a horrendous day up there on the farm you know and uh, of course my mother never got over it. Joe back in those days uh, you know 20 years old he was and uh, of course I miss him to this day I I was like his tail every place he went I was second in the family Jack was first and uh, he was my hero you know mm -hmm. so anyway uh, hey you, when you think about it, I mean, they say they did, didn't did die in vain. They did die in vain. There were wars after that. You know, what good it do to, to win the war, you know? Well, do you think that shapes, you've got sort of a mantra in life now that it's not worth being mean to other people? Oh, of course It doesn't not. cost us anything yes, to be nice. Yes, you wonder how these people, like the North Korean leaders, and I mean, gee, why don't they live and let live, you know? I mean, what are, they, what are they trying to do? Well, of course, it's all power. They want power, you know? That's terrible. And yet, when, now, your mother uh, then, in, in finding out about your brother, decided that joining the Army was not something in the cards for you, Joe. That, that's uh, how I got, that's how I left school. I was a senior. It was September 1944, and that's when Mother got the telegram that Jack was killed August 28th. And it took about three or four weeks in those days to get in the word. Now you'd, you'd hear the same day. But in any case, uh, mother, I would have been 18 in October. 
I was 17 when I started. My senior year or so, mother said to me, Joe, you're going to have to register for the draft, and they'll probably draft you in the Army. Would you please join the Navy? For She thought the Navy would be safer. Hmm. <laughs> Little did she know I wound up driving an ammunition truck on Okinawa. But in, in, in Okinawa, case, right. Yeah. But in any With case, the Seabees. Yeah. So anyway, uh, and uh, when I was serving my boot camp, the Army was, I was a big Army fan. Army was playing Navy, Joe, and all the guys, 100 guys were gathered around the restaurant. Restaurant. Why don't we say the, the radio. restaurant for? <laughs> the radio in the center of the barracks. And I was the only guy rooting for Army. <laughs> <laughs> That's when they had Blanchard and Davis. Army won 56 to nothing. Can you imagine? But in any case, uh, those were the good old days. But uh, So anyway, that's the reason I wound up in the Navy. And when I was discharged in May of 1946, I came out and uh, in September I went back to high school. I could have, uh, you know. And, and, and I think that leads us to... That's why I graduated in 47. In, but 45 was my actual so class. So can you imagine you were... Uh, this, is, this is lost on today's generation that you would have dropped out served in the military, Gee. been discharged, and then come back to graduate from high school and several years And did I feel out of place, Seth? <laughs> I mean, I was 19, which isn't bad, but I remember uh, I went down to Coach, and I said, Coach, uh, I, I want to go out for the soccer team. He said, Joe, you can't. You're 19. We don't accept anybody that's 19, you know? So uh, I, said, I was really disappointed that I couldn't play. I, I didn't join any of the other. I, I was in a lot of activities, clubs, by, you know. The, now, Joe, let's talk about in this picture, too. You talked about the discharge pin and sort of explained what what, what that is. Yeah, that's, of course, we, all the uh, uh, discharge servicemen called it the ruptured duck. <laughs> and it was an eagle, nice little pin. I still have it inside. And, uh, of course, we all wore it. We were all proud of it, that we were discharged from service, you know. And... Uh, so anyway, um, but like now, would you say this yearbook is one of your first opportunities at doing illustrations that were being mass distributed? It, <laughs> it's the, no, the one I did in the. So you, you know when we show some. Oh yeah, no, these were the ones I was really proud of. See the ones I did when I was a freshman, I did all the teachers, you know Frank Mason, and Grant E. Morris, and whatever, and I. I, I'd say I knew nothing about reproduction. I was only not 14 years old. So I shaded all, uh, after I did them in the pen, pen and ink, I shaded them in. So it costs more. What age did you learn about reproduction then, Joe? I never did learn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> I let them worry about it, you know? I'm telling you. But in any case, uh, uh, they erased all the pencils. And naturally, all I had done was the basic. So the reproduction, I mean, the finished product looked terrible, you know. And uh, anyway, the next time I, uh, I worked, I, I made sure that uh, they included the pencil work, you know. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that as a result of today, we've, we've kind of uncovered some of these lost treasures. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, you I, say, we have original Joe Sinnott work. You made work. copies of them? I will be. I will yes. make certain. They, they should reproduce pretty well, you know. Because, you know, the copying machines today, you can't tell them from the originals. So you came back to, to high school after having served in the military. Yeah. Uh, finish up in 47. You start working at the cement plant, the same one where your dad was a foreman? I worked, in fact, I started in the summer. Well, and, uh, you know, it was, none of the uh, industries in town, like Contines, paid any more. So being dad worked there, he... Got, my, got me the job there. Of course, a lot of veterans were looking for work then. But I knew I wanted to go uh, to art school, but I also liked playing ball. I was playing ball with the Saugerties All-Stars, baseball, that is. And I was playing softball also. And uh, so anyway, uh, you know, and I had a girlfriend. So I, I was just putting off going to school. Then 1948, the winter was the coldest in New York State history. I was working in the limestone quarry, where the, that's where the cement uh, manufacturing uh, process begins with the limestone. Then they, they ship it down to the mill where it's ground up and it's a, a long process. But it starts in the quarry 
And I worked up there in the quarry, and it was 30 below zero out in the cold, and uh, I, I kept visioning the uh, art studio, you know, with the nice model. And I said, I, it's about time I get the school. Get the school. Mm -hmm. So I looked around, I saw an ad in the uh, New York Times about Bernhardt's school uh, down at the, it was at the 89th Street in those days. So, uh, you know. So, uh, and we've, we've covered kind of how, what, how it went through the college and then you start, went over to Stanley. And uh, 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 if we go back to that Comics Code Authority and then what the impact was at that time, and I think in modern era, now we have TV shows like The Walking Dead and there's one that, it shocked me. It's called the American Horror Story, which is just one I never, violent murder I never see after them. another. Never see them. I I don't like to watch them because I don't like those images in in my psyche. I don't like to be exposed to them. And I just wonder if those same standards were try were applied today. Some. 50, 60 years later, you know, how, oh, how, do, are we, you how do we measure up? They, they'd ban everything ever on TV. Did we go too far, Joe? Uh, you mean back then? Now, yeah. Oh, oh, yes, as far as that, I think so, no question. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not for censorship, but I'm, I, 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 I'm for some censorship on certain things, you know? I mean, like you say, there's no limit anymore. And now I'm going to shift gears. I want to talk about something. Um, I asked a question, and I think I mi you, uh, you misunderstood me. This was on the phone a couple, several days ago. And I'm going to reword it. What I had asked was, which was worth more, a comic book which has been kept in pristine condition? To, and I mean for you as the artist. Or a comic which was loved by a child that might have been rolled up in their back pocket. <laughs> And, uh, you know, as they're riding their bike somewhere. Sure. Uh, so one is kept by a collector, never to be touched, looked at, and only read using, you know, tweezers. Or the millions of comic books that every kid would race to the comic book store or the newsstands. Uh, uh, every Wednesday was when they would hit the newsstands in my area. Really? Uh, and you'd go there, but you'd be waiting, you, you know, because every comic book had a cliffhanger. Sure. You never knew where was Spidey going to be course, next week. Of course, what, what was happening with that the... That made with you the buy the next issue. That made, that's right. But which to you as the artist is more valuable? The one maintained by the collector... Or the one which was loved and and adored well, by someone. because you like to say the one that was loved, but the one that's in pristine condition is certainly, especially if it's a main character, that's the one that's like. And of course, these comics are all graded. They gotta, they have an outfit that grades comics alone. What are the comic books that Joe Sinnott saves as part of his personal well, collection? Well, I'd have to say Mark because you know it's funny to me working in comics. It was a job. When I finished one story, like the Fantastic Four, I forgot all about it. I got the next script, and I started working on the next one. So I, I wouldn't even know what I had worked on. I f forgot about the character. Like Mark, he really, he knows all the characters, not only mine, but other people's characters. And I have to ask him a lot of times. Like very often, I'd be upstairs uh, at my desk, and the script will say, uh, Joe, uh, draw the Watcher, you know, because I, I, I remember working on the Watcher. And I'd say to Mark, he was eight, nine years old then. I'd say, Mark, what does the Watcher look like? He said, Dad, I'll have it out in a couple minutes. He'd go in the back room where I had all my reference and all that stuff, comics. And he'd be gone about 10 minutes and he'd come back and say, here's a good picture of him. He's on page 22. And... Issue number 16, you know. He knew just where to look, you know. And I don't even know what the guy looked like, you know. Because you, 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 you're working all the time. It's a job. And, uh, you know, you're making a living. So it's not like you were doing it for fun. But have you had the chance to stop and smell the roses or? Well, now you do. Oh, they, they treat you like a god. You go to these conventions. It's unbelievable, you know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you. Oh, see. They, they take videos of you and they... I, I wondered, I, I actually wanted to ask this question. Have you made more money in modern era 
on a, oh. a piece of your work that you did maybe in the 60s. That, for, <laughs> that I get a magazine. I don't buy it. For my, the same my, piece of artwork my that, friend that you in, did. In do, the, do you make more in today? Well, let me just, I'll give you one example. My friend in Woodstock, he gives me the... Uh, Oh, uh, it's a uh, it's a magazine I think called Heritage. Could be Heritage, but anyway, it comes out once a month. It's an auction uh, house out in California. It's like Sotheby's or uh, in, in New York City. But anyway, I was from some of those beautiful books. They have reproduction. A lot of comic art is sold through this auction house, and it said uh, page. I'll, I'll say page sixty-seven of the Fantastic Four, number 17, page 64, uh, page 17, uh, sold, it, it said it was a, a one page, one page, uh, four drawings of the Silver Surfer. Now, he's very popular, sure of course. Is. He was the he only- He was the harbinger of yeah. the end of your planet. Well, anyway, Come there was on. four. Somebody, How did you turn somebody was that was a, uh, <laughs> now I got paid probably Fifty dollars for inking it, you know, back in 1970. I'll say, somebody bought it. That was a big uh, silver, su silver surfer fan. Hundred sixty three thousand dollars, one page. Can you imagine? I got fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so th it depends on the, who the collector is and how much he wants to spend. But it's amazing. See, a lot of the collectors are movie actors. They have so much money they don't want to do with it. And I'll tell you who's a, a big, big collector of the Fantastic Four. He's a, what's his name? Uh, Billy Crystal. Oh. He, he's a big, uh, and of course he's got so much money. And they'll spend anything to get a page of original art. Original art is where the real money is. But of course, if you have uh, Action Comics number one come out in 1938. Millions of dollars. Uh, million, over a million. And uh, naturally, uh, you know, you if you have number one Spider-Man. Now, he, he didn't appear in Spider-Man number one. He His first time he ever appeared, that's, that's the important thing. He appeared in Amazing Fantasy number 15. Because, you know, back in those days, we didn't know if these characters were going to be successful. So Stan Lee put the first Sp Spider-Man story in Amazing Fantasy. And uh, of course, today it's worth probably $100,000, just, just the first story. And uh, worth more than Spider-Man number one because it's the first time he appeared. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've done so many characters, like the first appearance of Doctor Doom. I have that page. The first, that was in... the. Uh, Fantastic for number five. Number five. You knew okay. that, huh? <laughs> well. Uh, and, of course, it, you look back. I love the detail of, oh, of the face, the was, eye and the rivets. It was oh. crude, but he had like a leather mask in those days, you know. Of course, everything evolves, you know that. And everything gets better. Not everything, but some most things get better. And even today, Mar Marvel, most of the characters look at are that owned. that beautiful illustration. <laughs> Isn't that stylish? And they fire him because they thought he was passe. <laughs> Jeez, I'm telling you. Well, I, I was going to say, uh, uh, now uh, Disney has bought the Marvel characters. and Oh, are you kidding? It's brought to a whole new level. I had a guy came yesterday. Frank, he, he said, Joe, I was reading a book. Uh, it's underneath the orange book. Okay. Uh, yeah, just pick that up, uh, Seth. Okay. He said, I thought the maybe... The talented Mrs. Highsmith. Oh, I lost the page. Anyway, he said, I thought maybe... You'd like to see it. He said, it's got your name. And I said, really? He says, yeah. He said, it's about a woman. He was, she was an editor, and she had a lot to do with publishing and whatever. But she was at, she was at Marvel Comics uh, back in the early 60s. And she said, I met Joe Sinnott, one of the top artists at Marvel. <laughs> so she, he underlined it in red. And he gave me the book, but I don't know where it is now. Well, that's great. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, well, I'll tell you, one of the books which really oh. got me uh, an awful lot of information about you, Joe, is uh, something you put out of several years ago, uh, Brush Strokes with Greatness. I didn't put it out. Somebody else put it out. <laughs> oh, is that right? Although Mark. Mark was instrumental. He put it. all the artwork together, you know. 
And he gave it to uh, this company, John Morrill. Uh, it's called Two Morrill's Publications. And uh, the guy, a guy named John Cook, he did all the work of putting it together, which was a labor of love. When you when you look at all the all the stuff that he squeezed into it, it's it's amazing. Oh, there's by the way, there's Mark when he was yep. eight years old. Was Norman Rockwell. We were over to uh, uh, Statsburg and across to in Massachusetts, and uh, we talked to him quite a while about. Uh, you know, illustrations and comics. So Look at me with the mustache, Joe. <laughs> anyway, there's Mickey Spillane. And, uh, but anyway, this guy put together this book and uh, someone else wrote it, Tim Lasuda, a friend of mine out in Calgary. He wrote it, but the combination of, of the art and putting it together, putting it together had to be a, a lot of work, you know. These these are that was that's the character I used for um, Price Chopper. He was always, you know, breaking down prices, you know. And uh, there's the I used to do these every yep. every month, and I I thought the the, the girls I I thought that was pretty good. She's tying up her dog, but it always had to have a crossword in it, you know. I always liked that one, and it's funny. I always had to show the, uh, the the publisher the rough. In fact, he was he was in Kingston, the guy to put out the magazine, and uh, oh, he had some. He was a nice guy, Jim Quinn. Anyway, I I kept bringing that down, just like that, colored, rough, and he said, I don't know, Joe, there's something about the, the draft I don't care for. But every month I I put it in my other <laughs> samples, bring it down. No, don't like that. So one week I I brought it down. He said, "Gee, I like that, you know." And I, I had no change. It was the same thing I was bringing down for six months, you know. That was a record cover. So, uh, but Joe, you can see all different types of art I did, you know, down to the years. There's Jack Kirby. He was the one that did the, the silver. He created the Silver Surfer, and a great, great artist, of course. He, he was the best. And uh, but Buscema. December was the best draft. Now these I did on my own for well, treasure chest. It does the life of MacArthur and Eisenhower. This is what I really like. That's the reason I I couldn't give this up when Stan called me. Uh, that and Joe, let's let let's let's move into one of your other great contributions. Oh, good. Uh, beyond uh, working with Marvel and doing your other freelance work. Uh, you also not uh, began to do work uh, for the Catholic schools. Exactly. Can, can that you... was treasure chest, the yeah. ones I was just showing. That's the one I love working for because it gave me a chance to do my own drawings, and uh, I did a lot of uh, biographical stuff, you know. Like I said, he came much so, later than... So this is a brand new publication this week just uh, it's only a week old only a week old first edition uh well but this is a reprint so would you tell the story because yeah. this came down at the same time you were being you were working on the fantastic four there, uh, there i am working on one of its pages 1962 and uh of course like i said joe uh, no aches and pains then but uh the reason that picture was taken when they sent me the script for the Pope, Pope John Twenty Third, they said, "Joe, could you send us a photograph? We want to send it along with our publicity. Our publicity part wants it to send around the country to advertise the coming of the Pope John story." So I had Ronnie Johnstone take that picture, uh, which he did. That you can tell it's a professional picture, and uh, so anyway, that was '62. And, he, and this is going on at the same time you're supposed to be doing the ink for Stan Lee with the oh, Fantastic I, I Four. Oh, I did, yes. <laughs> now, you see this panel here? See this priest here? Y yes. All right. Can you make him out here? Yeah. See, I was working on page two, and uh, I would do one page at a time. And I, it's approved by the Comics Code Authority. I know, Look I at I that had, stamp. I had 48 pages to go before I was finished with that story. And as you can see... I, I, oh, I gotta watch that. I don't rip it. Oh, that's, 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 these are some stories on other popes that I did. 
for an outfit up in Albany. They uh, they printed it in the, in the Long Island Catholic and Catholic News. And you can see they put a lot of work in those. But they were different popes, you know. And uh, th this story ended here. Uh, with, that's when he spoke to the crowd. And uh, I, was, I was leading up to something. But oh, the reference that I had to get for this story was... And, and so you were, the original publication came out in uh, 1962, is that correct? Exactly. And why, why the reprint? Because he was just made a saint this year, Pope John the Twenty Third, and they thought they would capitalize on that fact. You know, the publishing company, and uh, of course they did re -enhan They enhanced the the coloring. Did a nice job coloring it. I didn't color it. I just did the the drawings, and uh, they did a beautiful job. And of course, it was in comic book form before. Now they put it like you can see it in a hardcover version, but uh, I, I was so happy with it, you know. And I saw once a, a piece of artwork you had done for Mother Teresa. Uh, oh, that was another one I was so proud of that. And I did uh, Saint uh, Father of well, he's out in the hallway, uh, Pope Pope John Paul. Pope John Paul we, II, right? Oh, I worked with another artist. He penciled it and I inked it. But I'll tell you, those two books. Uh, we we were paid royalties on them, and we made out very well, as you could imagine. And uh, but they were, you know, sometimes when I got a story like this or those, boy, I I put everything I had into them, you know, because you you, you enjoyed doing it and. You enjoyed seeing your work done as well as possible, you know. You know, I, and I think as I look at this, I'm looking at the Vatican. Yep. And I know I remember there, there was also another piece of artwork I'd seen you done for uh, Canyonlands National Park. Oh, I love that story. Time. But I wonder, have you been to these places? No, I was never to Europe. Then how do you capture it? Uh, photographs, you know, reference, some you make up. Canyonlands, they were all. Um, uh, Monuments, uh, sandstone, of course, that exist. So I had to have reference on them. And some are shaped like angels, and they all have names, you know, each one of these buttes, you know. But uh, oh, it's my ambition someday to go to Monument Valley, you know. Uh, it's, it's great. Have you been there? I have been, yes. Oh, I love the name. Of course, last night I was watching, uh, she wore a yellow ribbon, and they showed some beautiful scenery from the uh, you know, Monument Valley, and it was beautiful. And uh, But let's speak about, though, you had uh, first gone to kindergarten at a public school, at yeah. what's now called Cahill Elementary uh, exactly. School. Exactly. It was the Main Street School in Saugerties, yeah. New York. Then you went to uh, St. Mary's of the Snow. Uh, yeah, I graduated in 41 from there. <laughs> and I should have graduated in 45 from high school, but as you know, I went in the Navy so I graduated in 47 when I came back. What does religion mean to Joe Sinnott, though? It, it, it means a lot. You hate to talk about it, but uh, I miss Mass. I'm 88 years old. I miss Mass once in my life, and uh, I'm proud of that fact. And uh, Why did you miss it that once? <laughs> I, no, I, you know where? I was to an art convention down in uh, Arlington, Virginia, and I, I went with another fella. And uh, of course, he, he wasn't Catholic, and he had to get home on a Sunday. So I didn't say to him, Joe, I, I have to go to Mass, you know, so I didn't say nothing. But we came on home, you know. And uh, But I remember on Okinawa, I used to hitchhike to Mass. We had no priest in our outfit. And I had to hitchhike about 10 miles to, to go to Mass. But hey, you know, there's all kinds of uh, religious people uh, I, I don't think, I, I just do what I was taught to do in St. Mary's School, you know, and uh, I'm... It's a so, very personal thing, isn't it? Oh, it's, it really, it's hard to speak speak about, you know. I know Joe's father's, I, I think he's a very religious man from things I've read, you know, and... Uh, By the way, Joe Sinnott keeps referencing our friend off camera who's running the show here, Joe Zafino. <laughs> so don't, don't think he's calling me, Joe. No, we, let's, let's be clear. There's there's another guy uh, working the magic behind us. And yes, Joe, Joe's dad is a, a Yeah, I wish I knew individual. Joe's father uh, better than I... or met him sooner in life, you know, because 
Uh, he and I seem to get along pretty well together, and he's such a nice man. But do you know how meaningful this book is now to a new generation of Catholics? Again, this is the, here's what I mean: is the value of the cartoons, the value of the comics. It. it draws in children. Now a child wants to know about Pope John the Twenty Third, and it's and, fun. And you, it's you who's drawing them in. I know it's Seth, and also. When they told me they wanted to do the book, of course, the thing you worry about, will I live long enough to see it? You wanted, you wanted to see it. Do you think your talent was a blessing? Oh, of course, it's a gift. I think anybody, any uh, talent is a gift, you know, really. These little three-year-old kids that can do uh, uh, Einstein's equations, it's a gift. I mean, uh, these guys, little kids that can play saxophones or the piano, just sit down and play any song that you can think of, and they never heard it before. I don't know whether it's memory or, or what it is, but um, I, I saw a, a, a show on television. Let's turn this around, just so we can help yeah. advertise it. We want anyway, this, we want this to did sell. you ever hear these people? They have such a great memory. And do you remember the, the TV show uh, Taxi? Of course. Remember Louis? Uh, Louis. Louis De Palma. No, no. Uh, Andy Kaufman. Mary Lou Henner. Oh yes. All right. Very cute girl. Yes. She. They had five people on this show. She was one of them that had this gift. She can remember where she was. Any you pick a date in history during her lifetime, and they say, Mary Lou, where were you February the second, nineteen seventy six, and what did you have for lunch? She, just like that, she can tell what she had for lunch, where she was. That's a gift, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I have a pretty good memory. I think that's the reason I can draw. I know what people look like. I can look at an ear and I can draw his ear, you know? I think it's all memory. And the better memory you have, the better artist you are. I really believe that. And I tell kids in schools that, uh, you know. And yet there was at least one Catholic who wanted to put a kibosh on your doodling in class. Oh, that was Sister Agnes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you'll, ne you'll never amount to nothing. <laughs> what, is, what, what happened with Sister oh, Agnes? Oh, boy, I wish I knew. I wish I could, I wish, so, you know, I wish I could show my, even my high school teacher, I, she was so, so nice. Miss Spaulding, she married while I was a senior, uh, or a junior, I should say, became Mrs. Odell, she took a job in Kingston, and uh, Joe, she she served there for must have been 40 years. She retired. She lived in Woodstock, and I remember her husband. Uh, he took he he tuned pianos, things you remember, you know. But anyway, I often wanted to go up to Woodstock and show her my artwork that I had. You know, she was responsible in some ways, you know, and uh, never did. And then she finally died. She was in her 90s when she died. And she was a beautiful woman, uh, Athelia, Athelia Spaulding, her name was, you know. Jay, I should have asked her to the senior ball. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll use a segue on the word ball. How about Baseball Hall of Fame? Which one? What, what, did you, what have you done that's ended up in a Hall of Fame? The, the local one? No, the, oh, uh, that that's a different conversation. No, let's go with the uh, Cooperstown. Oh, well, hey. Here, let's I, we, we I got give the camera a good three, shot of you. Uh, three drawings up there. They alternate them. Some some years you see them, and, uh, you know, they take them down, put them in the warehouse, and put up others. And But I have a, uh, probably the one that I was most proud of was the day that uh, uh, Roberto Colemini was declared missing. Yeah. I drew up a quick cartoon on him, and uh, I showed it to Ken Smith. He was the director up there in Cooperstown. I used to go up to Cooperstown a couple of times every summer. And uh, anyway, he liked it. He said, can we put this on display? So they did along with his uniform and his, his glove, you know, and it was in the case there for years. And uh, so they started rotating stuff. And I did one of Bay Brute with Monty Irvin, and I did one with, um, who was, who, 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 I did three that are up there. Oh boy, I can't think of the other one. It's gotta be well, well known. Uh, but in any case, uh, I have, I've had three up there and uh, 
Not Ted Williams. I've never done Ted Williams. Isn't that something? I did a lot of Willie Mays. I was going to say, wasn't your favorite player in Willie Mays? Yeah, actually, when I was, I'm still a giant rooter, but I, Monty Irvin was my favorite player, even when, when Willie Mays was playing. Of course, uh, you know, Mays, I don't know whether you ever met him or not. He's, he's, I don't know whether it's ignorance or he's arrogant, you know, one or the other. But Monty Irvin was well-educated. He went to Orange, New Jersey High School. And he was the number one player in the, in the Negro Leagues. In fact, Branch Rickey wanted Monty Irvin to play with the Dodgers. But he played with the Newark Eagles, and the owner wouldn't let him out of his contract. So he, he went to the next best with Jackie Robinson. But originally, he wanted Monty Irvin. And Irvin won the batting title. He was just a great player. But he was a great football player. Uh, in the state of New Jersey when he played for Orange New, or New Jersey. And he's still alive. He's 93, lives in Florida, and a real nice guy. But see, that was another reason they, they thought Robinson was better because Robinson was arrogant and wouldn't take anything from anybody, you know. And he was able to put up, whereas Irvin would have been overwhelmed by the, uh, ad, you know, adversity, you know. Yep. and uh, But... But uh, Roy Campanella said that Monty Irvin was the best ball player he ever saw because he played with him in the Negro Leagues, you know. So, but, so uh, that's the connection I have with Cooperstown, you know, having the three drawing. But I probably could have brought up mothers, others over the years, but that's, I, I, I never brought up any after that, you know. Well then, uh, let's. You, you you said, well, do you want to talk about the local sports hall of fame? You're certainly a figure in <laughs> Saugerties athletic history and yeah. in Saugerties history for that matter. And what a great community uh, we're in. Um, I mean, we the list of of oh. outstanding individuals who come from this area. Oh, of course. Uh, I mean, we we're less than half a mile from where uh, Jimmy Fallon grew up. Right across, well, <laughs> over here on uh, Overball Street. That's uh, we have. I could hit a baseball that far, Joe. <laughs> you could too. We have a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient up uh, on the Main Street, Colonel Roger Donlin. And then, you know, another story. Of course, they they went to St. Mary's School, the Donlins. They had eight kids, like we had seven, and we were very close to families. Of course, Mike was in my class. Mike, he's, he's he lives in New Jersey, and. Uh, He's, he's not well. He's had a couple strokes. And Paul, Paul and I are very good friends now. Now, Paul's a year older than I am, and Paul was in my brother's outfit overseas. In fact, he came up to Mont Lamar the day after Jack was oh, killed. Oh, is that right? And so uh, he went through. Paul says, I went through A Company, and I said, where's the Jack Senate? And they said he was killed yesterday. And Paul said it hit me like a... Well, you know, like a rock, he said, I, you know. But anyway, so Paul's been a good friend of mine, and he went through a lot of action like Jack. He was on the NGO and whatever. And, uh, of course, there aren't too many left of the Donlin family, but they live in the same house up in the end. And I'll ask, is there a greater American than Colonel Roger Donlin? No. Well, he, uh, I mean, you know, what those guys did, it's unbelievable. Of course, the, so many of the, not only the whole, uh, Medal of Honor winners. There were so many that did things like that that were never seen. No one True. reported it, or it got lost in the files. And uh, that's so well, and so if, well known. And if I just stick with with our Saugerties contingent, another uh, young man who you just crossed paths with in the last several weeks, uh, Pete Zimiarch, oh, yes. who went on from our community to work with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical See, Weapons. I didn't know Pete. I knew all the Zimiarches. Back when I lived in but West Pete Camp. goes on to be part of the w recipients for the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, you heard uh, Mark before say, Joe, Joe Zimiart. Well, I knew Joe very well. Mark knows him very well. But I knew their fathers. There were three. There was Pete, Paul, and Anthony. And uh, they, lived, they lived in a farm in West Camp. They were all big, tall farmers, kids, you know. And Paul, he was in the Marine Corps. And I'll tell you, he was like six foot three, maybe four, and built like Tarzan. I'm telling you, he, was, he must have made some Marine, you know. Of course, he died very young, and he's buried right next to my brother's grave over in St. Mary's. And uh, But the Zimmy Arches were, they lived 
we had a farm and, and they had a farm, maybe maybe a mile apart, but it seemed like they were our next door neighbors, you know. But uh, so I knew the Zimmy Arches very well. I didn't know, uh, you know, it's not Paul. No, Pete. Oh, Pete. That's, well, he was named after his uncle. Right. Yeah, Pete Zimmy Arch. And uh, then, it, well, like I said, it was Paul. But he, Pete seems like such a nice guy when I met him, you know. I, I was glad to meet him, know who he was. And there. But what is it, do you think, about this community that we continue to generate, you know, uh, yeah. uh, individuals who are making an indelible mark on our society? Yeah, well, like I say, you can look back, I mentioned my cousin, Buddy Flanagan. Yeah, talk about Buddy Flanagan, oh. because that one that one is almost lost, Joe. And if, oh, you, don't, to, if to, you don't speak about it, I it's meant going to show to... you his picture. He, of course, he sent me a picture uh, when he was made general, uh, made brigadier general, and they, he became head of the Green Berets down in Fort Bragg, and he was there uh, when John Wayne made the movie. A lot of the movie was made at, at Fort Bragg, and uh, so he had a lot to do with John Wayne, showing him around the base and all that, you know. But Buddy, of course, grew up on, on Post Street, and... Uh, Great hockey player. He played hockey. So he didn't have any in those days. But when Colonel McEntee, his family became friends with a, 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 a colonel who lived in Saugerties, and he taught at West Point. He was a teacher down at West Point. He wasn't from Saugerties, but he lived over there on the, where uh, Bob Schnell lives. That was Colonel McEntee's house, and he had a sign out front, uh, Parade Rest. I thought that was great for a retired colonel. Anyway, he, uh, Buddy was going to, his two friends, Jimmy Reynolds and Eddie Montano, both became, they were in the same class. They both became priests. And Buddy was going to become a priest until his parents became friends with Colonel McEntee. And he got Buddy an assignment to West Point. So that's where he got the military career. So he, he went to West Point. He graduated in 1943. It was an accelerated class because they needed second lieutenants. And he would, he should have graduated in June of 43, but he graduated in 43. And he was sent to, the, he, he chose the 11th Airborne. He was a, a bit airborne and he fought in the Battle of Manila. That was his first battle. And in fact, after the war, he wrote 14 books. I got his books up there. See over there, Joe, uh, where it says, uh, Right there on the second shelf. Pull, just pull that out and, and show it to Seth. Now that's one of the books he, he oh, wrote. Sure. He, he was in the 11th Oh, look there. at that. Yeah, the Edward Michael Flanagan. Everybody called him Buddy. And uh, so anyway, he um, probably got his picture here. Oh, gee, his picture's not in it. Anyway, this Joe. Anything Look the up there in the top. See, see that picture of me in the Navy over here in the middle? Yeah. Set it aside and take out the one where it says The Angels, the white book. He's written 14 books on the 14th, uh, I mean the 4th, 11th, 11th uh, the Airborne. Now that, that was his, they were called the Angel, History of the 11th Airborne Division. Oh, there he is there. And this is your cousin, right? That's it. His mother was my father's sister. You can see he's a three-star general there. And he, he was very looking, very youthful looking for his age. He had a waist about 26 inches, just like at West Point. But anyway, when he went to West Point, he became a star hockey player on the, on the hockey team. And we used to go down and watch him play all the time. But like I said, the, most of his books, well, in fact, the first one he ever wrote was After the Battle, it was called. And I did all his illustrations for him, you know, he asked me if I would do it. And it was amazing. I knocked myself out, naturally, from my cousin. But uh, but anyway, Buddy, uh, he was quite a character. And uh, he fought, he fought in the Manila. He, there was a big uh, prisoner of war camp, uh, the, the 11th Airborne, freed all the prisoners from that, uh, that were, some of them were from the Bataan Death March. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, the, he was one of the first troops to enter Japan uh, after the surrender. And then he fought in Korea, 
And then Vietnam, he was General Westmoreland, uh, number one aide, you know, security, what do they call it, intelligence. Uh, he was in intelligence, so that's when he, then he was the controller of the army, which is a big post, post also. Then he became the Green Berets the commander. So he's had a lot of top-notch uh, assignments, you know. So we're proud of him, you know. And he's been in the, they've honored him in Saugerties as Grand Marshal, July 4th, some of the parades and whatever, you know. But he lives in Buford, hmm. down on the Marine Corps base, you know. Well, hey. Joe, uh, I, I want to bring it back to we got a couple of skeletons. You want to hear about them in the closet? <laughs> ah, everybody does, Joe, right? <laughs> well, maybe we'll save some things for <laughs> off camera. <laughs> I mean, they were the colorful stories. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you. Um, comic books, Joe, they make such an impact on society in general. Oh. I mean, the, the 60s and 70s, were the golden age. Seth, you got to go one of these big conventions. You won't believe it. I went to San Diego in 95, never again. Every day, it was at the San Diego Convention Center, right on the, right by the, where the Navy comes in, by the Navy base. 53,000 people a day go there. Right. They, they come from all over the world. Same way with New York now. It's getting as big as San Diego. They have it at the, the uh, and yet you, you were there when they started in the, yeah. in the 70s. 68 <laughs> was the first one I went to. But anyway, they have, uh, uh, i, I got to tell you another story. It's really funny. But anyway, they have it at the Javits Center. It's so crowded. That's the reason I don't go anymore. Like Yogi says, it's too, so crowded, nobody goes there anymore. <laughs> but it's, well, it, you know, there's truth to that story, you know? And uh, I don't go because it's so crowded. You can't move in the aisles. Sorry. Well, I was asking about what the, the impact of, of comics on society. Uh, and and I, I've got to tell you as well, it, oftentimes it was the vocabulary which was being used in comics, which was, you know, if, if you're reading it as a little kid, oh, all of this, what does that word mean, yeah, you know? Right. And, and, you know, hark. Well, of course, or, it's you know, much more sophisticated than it used to be, you know, because they know a lot of the readers are high school and college kids that, that read the, the books, you know? And uh, funny, you know, I uh, I worked on over 200 issues of the Fantastic Four, and I never read one story. Isn't that I, I was so busy. You know, time one, time I finished one, another one came in. So this John B. Semmett said the same thing. He never read one of the stories, you know. He would read what he had to do as far as the drawing went. But he said, I didn't read the... Balloons or the captions. I'll tell you one one comic thing that surprised me was, you you participated in although you always wrote for Marvel, you or illustrated for Marvel and did the inking, <clears throat> um, for the DC who's who in the DC universe. You you also contributed to that. Oh, I, I I don't know. Did I? <laughs> yeah. Because ah, I don't pay attention to DC. According to Mark's notes. Oh yes. really? <laughs> hey, probably you know. Hey. And people, they send me so many books. Uh, I have those books there. They've been there for a year. I can't, no place to put them. Hey, really. But, uh, uh, you know. But I, you know, even even though that's me in that book, uh, John Morrow put that out, of course. Uh, I think it's pretty good, you know. I hate to brag, but I love it, you know. Uh, it, they covered everything, you know. Well, not everything. One of the my favorite stories they never put in there. I did. Uh, I don't know if you remember the. Well, you might remember the movie Twelve O'clock High with the uh, Gregory Peck. Well, after that, they made a uh, uh, a TV show, Twelve O'clock High. Robert Lansing played the the, gen, the uh, uh, Gregory Peck part, and it was a good show. And then they they called me up, knew I could do likenesses. And they said, Joe, this was Dell Comics. Uh, we'd like you to work on the 12 o'clock high book we're putting out. And we, we like the way you do likenesses. So I did about five books. Uh, 12 I love doing that story. I love doing airplanes, the B-17 bomber. And I one of my favorite stories. And first thing you know, they switched the actors. And they wanted the younger, would you believe it? They wanted the younger actor as... Doc, uh, General Savage, 
and the uh, actor they picked, he looked younger, but he was older in real life. Oh. <laughs> His name was Burke, and uh, Robert Lansing was, he was, <laughs> I don't know, I don't want to say heartbroken, but he, he made a good doc, uh, General Savage. But in any case, they canceled the, the TV show. Uh, so when they canceled the TV show, they had to cancel the comic book. Mm -hmm. you know? So I stopped doing the comic book, the, the, uh, you know, 12 o'clock high. Uh, but I was a little disappointed. That's the only thing that the book doesn't have is my drawings from the uh, 12 o'clock high, which I really like. Who was your favorite villain? Oh, no question, uh, Dr. Doom. <laughs> and, you know, Mephisto's another great one. You know, are you familiar with Mephisto? No. Oh, uh, he's supposed to be a takeoff on the devil. And, uh, uh, great, great character. I'll show you. And tell us, you know, for those of us... Uh, who Novices. Who are, yeah, novices, because listen, I, I know in the universe of comic historians, you are certainly ah! judged by ah! what knowledge you might have of a specific detail of a specific comic book. And if you don't know... John Byrne, of course, John Romita, they're alive. Joe Rubenstein, that's, that's Stan Lee's brother. But Stan Lee's real name is Lieber. Okay. Uh, Stan Lee Lieber, that's his name. And that's his brother, Larry Lieber. But he, he maintained that name. Sal B. Simon, that was John's brother. Let me see if I can find that one page. Oh, it's a great, great old, here it is. That's Mephisto. That's who that, uh, you know, because you actually gave me a, a picture with him in it, and I Did didn't I, know who it was. Yeah, he's all red, actually. Correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, he's a takeoff on the devil. He lives in hell, so to speak. You know, everything's flames and rocks. I love that character. But Dr. Doom is the, is the big one, you know? You'd actually given me a picture, with, and, and Mephisto's in it, and I could I could identify every other person. Isn't and, and that something? I, I don't have them in color. I've, now, do, I've done many drawings of them in color. What See, about, that's Dr. Doom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What about the Cisco thing? Well, that that's a great story. Uh, that's right here. I, Jack Kirby called me up and said, Joe, I just did a drawing called the, uh, not the First American, oh boy, First American, something like the First American. He was a superhero, and he, he wasn't a Marvel character. So he said, they asked me to do it, and he said, I'd like you to ink it, because Jack couldn't ink. He said, and I said, all right. So I inked it for him, he liked it, so he called me up, said, Joe, how, what do I owe you? I said, Jack, you don't owe me nothing. I said, some noontime when you're on your lunch break, do a quick sketch of the thing for Mark. Mark was a little kid then, eight, nine years old. I said, Mark uh, loves, uh, you know, the thing. So he said, uh, oh, okay. So a couple weeks later, I got this drawing in pencil, yeah. about this big, Seth. We'll show, we'll show that. Anyway. So uh, he says, uh, hey, Mark, I, I told him to, to sign it to Mark. Howdy, Mark. There's a, com there's a comic first, the Cisco thing. The Cisco Here's a comic thing. first. So anyway, I loved it. So uh, one day I, I inked it, and uh, after I inked it, I said, gee, I'm going to color it also. So I colored it with colored inks. And, of course, Mark got, got it hanging in the living room at, down at the house. And he wouldn't trade it for nothing. You know, really, you know? I mean, from Kirby, well, a, I mean, any Kirby you drawing have a Jack today. Jack Kirby, Joe Sinnott original. But Kirby is worth a lot of money, a Kirby, especially something like this that I hand colored, you know? But in any case, that, so that's the story behind the, the Cisco thing. <laughs> but Kirby was something, I tell you. And a prodigious worker. He worked seven well, days a week. Can you imagine? You know, I, but I, I keep coming back to this, Joe. Imagine, you know, you're, someone my, of my generation, uh, I'm, you're a young kid. I would watch The Electric Company, a TV show, only because at the end was a skit on Spider-Man. No kidding. Right? So, so I never saw it. It, it. it was, a you know, and probably thinking back, it was 
you know, maybe, <laughs> not, the be maybe not the best. It was the <laughs> actors acting out spider -Man. But we would sit through an educational show for a three-minute skit from Spider-Man. Nice. And then in class, every kid of my era would be in their social studies book, would be hidden some comic book of some sort. <laughs> and a teacher would come along and grab that and rip it up and tell us how foolish it was. And we, so many of, of, of my era too, we have the stories of when our parents threw away those ratty comic books that were collecting dust and mold, yeah, really. only to look back and think that was an original, you know, uh, I know I have one that was Daredevil versus the Punisher. You uh -oh. probably heard Bob Moser tell the story about when he went off to the Navy and he came back and his mother threw out his, all his baseball cards and he said he had some collection. You exactly. Know? Really? <laughs> They had a store in Sogby's for a while called Mother Threw Them Out. A comic <laughs> store. It went out of business. But, yeah. Gee, it's amazing. Uh, let's see. I was going to say something else about uh, comics. Oh, I can't think. So ask me one more question. Uh, well, I want to know, how did the process go? Because you were lucky enough to come live in Saugerties. Tell me how it goes from the time I you received... I didn't come to live in Saugerties. I was born in Saugerties. But I mean, rather than being in New York City as oh, a contributor I, to, oh, to Marvel, yeah. uh, tell me when it when the, when that envelope shows up with something for you to do, what happens? How does it go? Well, of course, uh, I'll, I'll go the, back the just process, a little bit. The process. I went to school down the city. I grew up, I was born in Sardis. My father was born here. My grandfather was born here. My great-grandfather came over in 1838 from Ireland, settled in Sardis. So, all right. So, we move ahead. When I went to school in the city, after I finished school, I got work with Stan Lee, and uh, I like Saugerties. This was 1950. Now, this is before IBM moved in. You know, nobody was here, Joe, in those days. You knew everybody on the street, you know? So I came back to Saugerties because I like all my family was here. We were a close-knit family, you know? So I came back to Saugerties and uh, started working. My studio was upstairs. so. I would get my script. We worked from the script in those days. Uh, first class special, it would come, and of course I'd start on it. Like uh, say it came on a on a uh, uh, well Friday. All right, I'd start it on a Monday, and by Friday, Thursday, I'd have it all finished, pencil and ink, because they were short stories and five and six page stories. So Betty and I would drive down the city park the car up in 238th Street, take the subway down. They were in the Empire State Building at that time, Marvel. It was timely comics then. And, of course, I'd show the art to Stan, and he'd give me another script off this pile, and then we might go to a movie or go have something to eat. And I'd come back home. I'd start it Monday morning, same process, and I'd be through Thursday, go down Friday. So I did that for about 10 years, and I said to Betty, you know, I'm going down every Friday. I'm losing a whole day. I could be working on that day, you know. So I stopped going down to Marvel, even though it was only a two-hour ride, basically. And uh, so anyway, it was over 20 years before I went down again, you know. And we had a, uh, a 1975 convention, Marvel, at the uh, Commodore. And they had a seat for me up on the dais. It was Stan, me, me John Buscema, and John Romita, uh, a couple other guys. So anyway, Stan was down, down a ways, you know. I was, I was late when I got there. So I sat down, and uh, so Stan waved to me, you know. So uh, he, he, uh, uh, he said to me, uh, oh, he hollered down. He said, uh, Jack, he said, how you been? I said, Jack. I said, so I got up. I hadn't seen him in 20 years, you know, even though I talked to him every week on the phone. So I walked down to him. I said, Stan, uh, he said, Jack, he said, how come you don't come back and work with us anymore? He thought I was a, a, a guy named Jack Keller. He used to do westerns. He lived in uh, Pennsylvania. And I thought he was teasing me, you know, Jack Keller. So I said, well, I said, if you paid more, I'd come back, you know. Mm -hmm. So he looked at me strangely, you know. So uh, I went back and sat down in my seat and the uh, so I saw him talking to John Ramita next to him. John and I were good friends. And John must have said, Stan, that's Joe Sennett. So he got up and he came down to me and he said, Joe, he said, I thought you were Jack Keller. 
I said, Stan, we haven't seen each other in 20 years. And I said, uh, so he, the, he had a big crowd there, you know, so he, he, he told the story to the people. They all got a big kick out of it, you know. <laughs> that, was, it was, that was funny. But, uh, but hey, I don't know, I've never met Jack Keller, but he must hope he's still living in Pennsylvania. Maybe, you know? Must have been a good looking guy, though. <laughs> <laughs> 1975, can you imagine? So, so uh, Joe, Joe, we've covered a lot of bases. Um, is there anything we haven't hit on? Um, gee, I, 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 if you go, I'll say, gee, why didn't we talk about this? And talk? <laughs> Joe, open that closet, and right on the top, put, put, there's a picture, I want two pictures, I want right on the top to the right there. I want to show Seth. Now, if you want to see a nice picture. All right, what do we have here? Uh, this, is, this is really an interesting story. This is 1936, and they had just built the post office, the WPA. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, this was after school. School was out. And uh, I was up to Ted Overpause. He was my buddy, you know. And he, I, we said, what, what, what do you want to do, Ted? He said, well, let's go down. My fa his father was the mayor. He said, let's go down. They're going to take his picture on the steps of the post office. And he said, put it in the paper. He said, maybe we can get in the picture. So uh, I said, okay. So we went down. And Ronnie Johnstone just came to Saugerties from Canada. He was the photographer. So he's out in the middle of the street, no traffic in those days, you know. So he's got the black cloth over with the tripod and everything. And he said, and there was a lot of people watching, you know, because, you know, it was, they were dedicated in the post office. So he said, why don't everybody get in the picture, you know? So all the people started getting in the picture. So I knew this other kid. Uh, I didn't pal around with him, but I knew him. So he, he got in the first row, so I went up and stood next to him. He was older than me. So I was looking to see what he was doing, and he had his arms folded. So I folded my arms, you know, and I'm standing there, and I looked around, and I didn't see my friend, Ted Overbaugh. Anyway, he was sitting on the curb, but he didn't get in the picture. So anyway, they took this picture of all the people, 1936. That little scuffy guy is me. Can you imagine? <laughs> Look at that hat. Dirty old baseball hat, and this guy here, his father he, he ran the bakery in the, in the who do you call this, uh, grocery store, Jaffe's Grocery Store. Is that great? That's Grant Morse there too, isn't it? No, no, no. That, it looks like him, doesn't it? it? Sure does. Let me let me hold it this way. Oh, you want to show it? Well, it's okay. We we'll get it. All right, but any we'll case, this uh, this Sally Bernier, Sally Russell. Her father owned the paper company and so he made sterling books. You remember the books with the the binders and uh, all that stuff. All she made they made all school books. Right. And was he, it that he was known movie? throughout the, the country, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying the to think. Sterling. Anyway, so this guy, like I said, I knew him but I didn't know him. And of course this was a this was a he's still alive, but Franklin Clum, his father had a uh an automobile store in town. Now here's, here is my cousin, Buddy Flanagan. He's the one that became the general. Now he was, I think, a sophomore in high school. And you can see we must have all came from school because everybody's wearing a tie. I even got one on. And, uh, but probably after school, <laughs> I ran right up to my friends, Ted Overpaws, you know. So it was a, it was a school day. And of course, th that's Ted Overpaws' father. He was the mayor. And these are all dignitaries from town, plus people. This guy was a famous, let's see, uh, where is, oh, oh, there he is there. He was a famous sculptor. He, he did beautiful work. He lived out by high woods. Mm. And, uh, but all these old geezers and whatever, <laughs> and a lot of the kids. So anyway, when they were made the new post office, what, how many, 10, 10 years ago maybe? Uh, they called me up and they said, Joe, we know you have a picture of the old post office. Could we use it for the paper? And also, I know it's hard, but could you look and see if there's anybody still alive from that picture? So Harry Zillman was still alive. He, he worked in the post office. This is Harry up here. Uh, let's see now. Let me. Oh, there's Harry right there. 
Well, anyway, Harry was like in his 70s now. So we got together and we went over every person to see if they're alive. And there were a few that were alive. So I contacted everyone, see if they could come to the dedication of the new post office. Of course, Buddy Flanagan couldn't make it. He was down in Buford. He, he was tied up. And these are the people that were left. Wow. The only ones. That. That, of course, this, this guy, Toots, Toots Hollenbeck, that's him right there. And there he is here. Now, this guy, in fact, we par purposely, there he is there. This, this, uh, see this fellow, this kid with the knickers? Yep. That's him. And I'm next to him. So th that's me. <laughs> so you, you two crossing arms back and, then, and, and there you right, are. And you see one. this guy here? Yeah. No, right there. Mm -hmm. He's the Monsignor. And, of course, Franklin Klum is this little guy here, you know. So anyway, these are the ones that were left, plus maybe two or three guys from here. These are, oh, the people are all dead. And Sally's still alive. But she, she didn't come to the reunion. But anyway, don't you think, that picture's hanging in the post office, by the way, the new post office. That's great, Joe. Yeah. That's great. I thought, well, I'm great for reminiscing, you know. <laughs> Joe, did you see that picture of me? That's me with the baseball cap. <laughs> I'll tell you, those were the, and there's the, the next picture is the reunion. That was the only people left that I could get a hold of. Well, Joe, I got to tell you, maybe I'm done with the questions, but I want to give you an, any opportunity to speak. But uh, here's what I, what I want to say to you is on behalf of all of the fans, of all of the little kids who hid the comic books from their teachers, ah. <laughs> who stashed them where their parents wouldn't know, who learned about life from the art. I want to say thank you. Come on. And I want to acknowledge... Nicely said, Seth. Joe, you are an individual whose life was spent making others look better. I came along at the right time. Really. I always said that, you know. Of course, we grew up, Joe didn't, of course, he came later. But the 30s was a, it was a great time for a kid. We didn't know we didn't have any money. Everybody was poor. But like I said before, we had comic strips for the first time, Superman for the first time. I mean, all, comic books came out in 1938. There were no comics for that. The movie serials, Lone Ranger and uh, Flash Gordon and all those great serials, you, you saw two movies, usually a Western, a comedy, and then the serials on a Saturday afternoon for 10 cents. So the 30s was a great time to grow up, really, you know. And then, of course, right after the war, everything exploded. P kids went off to college, you know. And that's when the country exploded, you know. Families were broken up. So there was some good and bad after the war, you know. And uh, But, hey, here again... When I, went, when I started comics in 1949, there were a lot of comic companies, not just Marvel and DC. And if you were halfway talented, you could get work. Of course, today it's very difficult to get work, you know, for a lot of reasons. But what advice would you have for the kid who's in class, who gets caught uh, doodling, uh, what would, and the teacher says, cut that out? What do you want to say, say to that I, child? I would say, uh, teacher... There's a friend of mine uh, that I know of, Joe Sennett, his name is, and he did the same thing I did, and look where he is today. <laughs> and look where I am today, <laughs> sitting next to a legend. Thank you very much, Joe, for being part of this, this <laughs> interview today. It was a lot of fun. Uh, thank you very yeah. much, sir. And uh, with that, we'll be signing off Seth Turner with JPI-TV with American legend Joe Sennett. Thanks a lot, Joe. You did a great job.